This infrared video shot in total darkness shows some of the remarkable behaviors used by one of only two species of snake in Southeast Asia that eat crabs. The jaws and teeth of this species of snake are ill-suited for capturing a hard-bodied prey such as a crab because they cannot penetrate the hard body. So Fredonia has a very unique behavior because it goes after the crab with a closed mouth and uses its chin and its neck and then the body to pin the crab against the mud when both the crab and the snake are on the surface of a mud. Only later does the snake actually open its mouth and then bite the crab and begin swallowing. Here you can see Fordonia beginning to swallow and usually this species of crab eater swallows on one side of the crab's carapace. Now because the legs of the crab are located on either side of the carapace, sometimes the snake may have just one skinny leg in its mouth and it's fairly easy to work its way down to the base of the leg, but then when it reaches the base of the leg, the tremendous depth of the carapace acts something like an anchor and makes swallowing extremely difficult. Now the crab that this snake is swallowing is very near the limits of the maximum size that it can eat and you're going to see an example of how it copes with this by rocking back and forth and snapping a leg off and then swallowing it separately. You can notice that Fredonia makes extensive use of its body to continue to hold the crabs nearly throughout the entire swallowing process. And rather than forming a lot of coils that make complete loops around the crab, usually this species uses its belly to continue to press down on the surface of the crab. Sometimes it may just be pressing the crab against the mud. Other times, as you can see here, the crab is actually in between a couple coils of the body. Now notice that the snake has broken the leg off and is swallowing. Uh, this isn't a completely easy thing to do because it is actually swallowing from the tip of the leg to the base of the leg and the tip of the legs of these crabs are very sharp. So even this takes some effort. After the snake has swallowed one of the legs that it's ripped off of the crab, it needs to relocate the remaining portions of the crab. And remember, the snake was in total darkness. We can only see what's going on because an infrared camera was used. And, as is the case with nearly all snakes, the sense of smell plays a vital role in the snakes locating their prey. So right after that leg was swallowed, you could see the snake flicking its tongue out. That picks up particles of odors, which are analyzed by the Jacobson's organ in the roof of the mouth of the snake. Now once again, after the snake has located the crab, it continues to use the body to restrain the crab, and it's also beginning to swallow some of the additional legs on the same side that it had originally started swallowing the crab on. Fredonia leucobalia belongs to a distinct evolutionary lineage of snakes known as the homolopsines, which are also sometimes referred to as the mud snakes. And there are approximately 40 species of these snakes, although active work is still trying to determine exactly how many species exist within this evolutionary lineage that is centered in its diversity in Southeast Asia and especially diverse in around southern Malaysia, southern Thailand, and the Singapore area. Now all of the homolopsine snakes have a rudimentary venom apparatus consisting of an enlarged groove tooth on the rear of the maxillary bone. When homolopsine snakes bite something, secretions can go through the groove in this enlarged tooth on the rear of the maxillary bone, but the effects of these secretions vary widely. And in fact, this is the case with rear fang snakes throughout the world, where in some species the venoms are dangerous to humans, in other species the venoms are very potent for paralyzing or killing the prey, and in still other species 
we haven't really been able to define uh, to find any substantial effects of venom either on humans or the normal prey species. Now with those species of homolopsine snakes that eat fish, the venom apparatus is effective enough that it can either paralyze the fish or kill the fish, but we have never found any evidence of an important role of venom for either immobilizing or killing crustaceans. One of the things that's rather remarkable is how tough crabs are to kill because one method of finding out what the snakes eat involves gently pressing along its stomach and getting the snake to regurgitate the crab. And in many instances, after I've caught Fredonia in the field and done this, so it's been over three hours when the snake has eaten, the crabs were still alive, got up, and ran away. All three of the species of homolopsine snakes that eat crustaceans belong to a single evolutionary lineage. Thus the simplest explanation of their feeding behavior and diet is that a recent common ancestor to all three of these species ate crustaceans, but then as speciation occurred we see some divergence in the details of the crustacean prey that are consumed by these different species. One species belonging to the genus Cantoria eats only snapping shrimp. The two remaining species eat crabs, and Fredonia leucobalia, shown here, eats normal hardshell crabs, whereas a sister species in the genus Gerarda only eats soft crabs after they have just molted. Fredonia has some anatomical specializations that help it to eat these formidable prey items. Its teeth are not as long, sharp, and fragile as in most species of snake, and the walls of its stomach are greatly thickened. But perhaps one of the most amazing evolutionary innovations that has allowed this species to eat this very abundant resource that's underexploited by other species of snakes are the behaviors it uses. As far as I know, all other species of snakes in the world that have been studied so far begin their attack on prey with an open mouth strike. So Fredonia is unique in that its attack on the prey begins with a closed mouth strike and shortly thereafter it uses its body to pin the prey and only then does it bite the prey. This is a great example of how evolving a behavior can overcome some of the limitations in function that occur as a result of the anatomical design. In this particular case, the teeth and mouth of snakes are simply very poor for trying to catch a hard-bodied item, and yet this unique behavior accomplishes that task very handily.